I thought I'd be the last person you'd ever let him hurt. If it had been you that he'd beat to a bloody pulp, if he had taken you from this world, I would have done nothing but search the planet for this pathetic pile of evil death-worshipping garbage and send him off to hell! Welcome back to Thinking Critical. This is Wes, and it's been a big week for new comic books. I've already hit uh, the new creative team on Superman. I already did the new uh, X-Men series, Children of the Atom. Today I'm going to talk about two new comics, two new series from from DC, one of them being the one of the new Batman anthologies, uh, Batman Urban Legends. I'm not going to talk about all the stories. I'm going to talk about one story about why I like it so much and why it is absolute dynamite character uh, exploration. And then I'm going to talk about Joker, which almost feels like it should be an anthology because it's got that stupid punchline backup story. I'm not going to talk about punchline. I'm going to talk about Joker but from James Tynan. Also, wonderfully establishes character motivations and really gets to the heart of Jim Gordon, but then just goes off the rails with so much unbelievable bullcrap that it you know it lowers the score. That could have been like a four, four and a half star comic book if they'd focused on the Jim Gordon stuff instead of throwing a bunch of weird stuff that would never happen. It just does not make sense within the Batman universe, and I'm going to get into that why. These were much better than than either the the Superman or the uh, Children of the Atom comic. I would recommend both. The Urban Legends, the story from, from Chip Zdarsky is like a four and a half, borderline five-star story. It's almost perfect. It is, it is a great comic book. It should just be Chip Zdarsky's Red Hood like miniseries. That's what it should be. The Joker story is like three, three and a half stars. Maybe, maybe it's like four because the art's pretty good. It is certainly driven down by that punchline story. It's so bad. They are... They are ruining Punchline. I'm not going to get into the reasons why because I don't have time for it. I don't even want to talk about that comic. I already talked about a bad comic yesterday. But James Tynan and DC Comics might be slaying a golden goose in Punchline with the way they're rolling the character out and making her so terrible. Now, before I get into the details about these two wonderful character, character explorations that I think one of them delivers all the way through, one of them kind of goes off the rails, I do want to say if you like comic book reviews, comic news, opinions, Thinking Critical YouTube is likely a place for you. Subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell for notifications. Give me a thumbs up if you enjoy this. Thumbs down if you don't. Either way, I want to hear your thoughts on the Jim Gordon story in Joker. It's not a Joker story. It's a Jim Gordon story. And the Red Hood Jason Todd story in Batman Urban Legends. It's not a Batman story. It's a Red Hood, Red Hood story, and it's it's fantastic. Now, let's get into the Red Hood story first because it is whew, it is fire. So opening up, we've got Jason Todd. He's like investigating some things that are going on on the streets. There's a new drug out there called teardrops. And when, when people take these drugs, they get into a euphoric state and all these wonderful things happen to them. And it causes them to, to like walk out in front of cars, walk off the ledges. And, you know, it's bad stuff. It's only been on the streets for a few weeks. Jason Todd is on the case. And as he, he's kind of hemmed up his first guy, and it's made very clear, he does not kill people at this point. We know that Jason Cod Cod has gone off the deep end before, but he now he's firmly established as an anti-hero somewhere between Batman and the Punisher. Closer to Batman than the Punisher. You know, he's not murdering people. He's using rubber bullets, non-lethal uh, means and all that stuff. But there's a really well-done opening scene here that really gets to the heart of the character and the story that Chip Zdarsky wants to tell. And he's hearing these cops talk about how just last week there were some kids shooting guns and that gangs were giving these kids guns and, and having them like fire practice before they're ready to bring them in on, you know, full time. They're like, oh my goodness, how could they do that to children? And as Jason Todd is hearing this, it brings him back to the days when he was a very young man under the care of Bruce Wayne in Wayne Manor. And he's, he's, remembering his life before be, essentially being Robin. I guess he's Robin in training at this point. He hasn't really gone out on missions. You can see he's very young. There's some really good character work for Alfred in this comic book. I'm not going to go too in depth on it, but the trepidation and the guilt he personally feels by going along with what Bruce Wayne is doing with Jason Todd after what happened with Dick Grayson you can see Alfred does not want to be doing this. He does not feel like this is a good good plan, but he is a good soldier, and he's going along with Master Wayne, and he's doing his best to kind of keep Jason Todd out of trouble, but Jason Todd is a bit of a hothead. It certainly ended up kind of being his undoing eventually, 
but you can see the weird stuff. Like he's he's at he's in the Bat Cave. You, there's hints that the Joker, you know, they're investigating stuff with the Joker, and then you know he's he's got the batterings in his hand. Should eight year olds be really throwing ninja stars? And he's got all the apparatus, and you could almost see. Obviously, this story is from his point of view. You could almost see that he almost feels like maybe he was probably well, he probably feels like he was abused as a child by Bruce Wayne and the training that he put him through. Like he probably doesn't feel like <laughs> in retrospect, he might have asked for it as a kid or went along with it. I think in retrospect, he probably wishes Bruce Wayne had not brought him along on this ride. And he appears to kind of obviously that moment brings him into this. He kind of equates with the what the gang members are doing with kids with guns to what was done with him as a young Robin. Now, obviously, that's from his point of view, and it's more of an extreme point of view. Everything's kind of, uh, you know, the truth lies in the middle. But it is crazy. Like, this is certainly not new information or new trope that Batman, Bruce Wayne, is out there bringing young men under his uh, care and then training them to be killers or assassins or, you know, vigilante crime fighters. He certainly wasn't training to be killers and assassins. He was training them how to be crime fighters without doing that. Obviously, Jason Todd did turn, take a turn after being murdered. There's also the art in this by Eddie Barrows is absolutely perfect. I love this. There's this wonderful scene. It's not a wonderful scene, but it's very well executed where he's he Jason Todd walks into the room full of guns. And he's sitting there looking, and finally Bruce Wayne Batman's behind him. You can see the fear in his eyes, like, oh my god. Uh oh, and like the physical intimidation, obviously from his point of view, remembering it as a kid, how physically imposing Batman must have been on him as a very young Jason Todd. And Batman goes on to explain to him, like, listen, I don't use guns, but I need them to test forensics, and, and I know, need to know how these things work. The only people that use guns are cowards. Obviously, he wasn't meaning that as a a mark on Jason Todd's character at, at when he was eight years old. But, you know, looking at him as a as an adult now, he does use guns. So they certainly have a differing philosophy. And I thought this was really good work laying the foundation for what Chip Zdarsky wants to do with Red Hood and establishing maybe the way he perceives Batman and the care that he received as a young man, but also how he received Alfred and the way that he cared for him. And it, there's, it's certainly... He certainly has more fondness for Alfred. He further investigates. He ends up in this apartment, and he goes in there, and this mother has been taking teardrops. She's overdosed. She's in a coma. Jason Todd comes in there. There's this little boy. He's scared out of his mind. He's crying. Jason Todd pulls his mask off, you know, trying to calm him down, provide him some comfort, and he remembers, you know, his mother OD'd on drugs, and he's like, I can't leave this kid here. When the police come here, they're going to throw him in a foster care. He's going to be part of the system. I don't want that to happen to him. So he enlists the help of Barbara Gordon Oracle. He's like, Listen, you got to track down this number. I need to find out where this guy is. This is this kid's father, and I need to track him down because I do not want this kid to be part of the system, fall through the cracks. I want to give him a chance. He needs to be with his father. And obviously, this has been not only traumatic for the kid, certainly more traumatic for this child whose mother is in a coma. She's smiling like the Joker. It's, it's crazy. But it's certainly been traumatic for Jason Todd. You know, he's bringing up all these memories of the things that happened to him as a young man that, that kind of put him on a troubled track. And he's trying to do something good because you can tell he sees himself in this little boy. Like, you know, I wish somebody had kept me out of the system, maybe, maybe found my father. It maybe maybe I wouldn't be here in this this predicament today. So there's these wonderful shots where he's like walking with the boy, even though it's it's Gotham and it's disgusting and it's raining and they're in this terrible neighborhood. He's holding his hand, this really optimistic point of view as far as what Jason Todd is doing. Even though he's got a big sword on his back, he's certainly got a gun on his on his hip. I really liked like Jason, like you would feel the determination in Jason Todd that he he's on a mission to do something good for this little boy because he feels like he sees himself in there. And he explains to him, listen, we are in the worst part of town. Your father is in that building. You cannot go with me. I do not know what's going on there. It does not look nice. I need you to be strong. I need you to be brave. I want you to stay here for me and, and you know, and 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 wait for me. I'm gonna bring your dad back. 
And he's like, oh, well, I want to be a superhero. Well, he's, if you're a superhero, you know, got to have a superhero name. And the little boy is looking at to him. He's got the, the Red Hood mask on, like wide-eyed, like he's looking at somebody important. And he's like, well, what's your superhero name? And he says, I'm Red Hood. And the little boy says, well, I'm Blue Hood. And you can see, like, the expression. Eddie Barrows knocks it out in this one. And we're seeing Jason Todd buying into his mission. He's on a mission. He's going to get this kid. He's going to keep him out of the system. And what happened to him is not going to happen to this little boy because he deserves better. He's the Blue Hood. And it, just wonderful stuff. Just, oh, my goodness. I could eat this up all day. Just really good exploration, really giving the motivations to Jason Todd. He needs to find this father. This boy needs needs a better fate. But what happens is he goes in the building. He obviously he immediately undergo he's he undergo he immediately gets in trouble. People are shooting at him. Things of that nature are happening. And the reason he finds this thing, and, and there's all this drug paraphernalia in the mother's apartment to begin with. It turns out that that man works in the the building that is making these cheerdrops drugs. He's part of the manufacturing process. And he's looking for this guy. I think his name is Andy. I might be wrong on that one. And he finally, he tracks him down. He's like, listen, I've got your son. You know, I, I want him to be with you. I don't want him to be a part of the system, but I don't know if there's anything I can do now. I think I have to call the police. And then the guy says, hey, who gives a shit? Jason Todd's like, what? You heard me. Kid was a pain in the ass. Him and his damn mother. Probably F word there. I honestly don't give a F if he lives or dies. Kid was whiny. I'm going to say AF. Even when I gave him some of my supply to keep him happy. Both of those F and leeches can go to. So this dude hates that boy. He feels like he's a burden. He felt like his wife or the boy's mother, obviously, was his girlfriend and his wife, was also a burden. He gave him drugs. He gave him cheer drops for him to be less whiny. And this is how you can, you can send Jason Todd over the edge in a Breaking Bad moment where he says, screw it, I'm not using rubber bullets anymore. It's time to go full Punisher on this guy. And he lights him up and murders him. Now, this is the fir first part of a six-part story. And there's other good characterization about how like Barbara Gordon's stuck in the middle between him and Batman. There's certainly a little bit of Batman in here, but the work on Jason Todd laying the foundation of how Jason Todd sees his current situation, laying the foundation of what Jason Todd sees in this boy and why he's on this mission to save him and what it would take to drive him over the edge, it would be that this man gave that boy drugs. That this man apparently hated him, did not care what happened to him, was glad that he was gotten rid of him. And that was enough for Jason Todd to snap. In my opinion, all of this made sense. It was, a, It's not the, the most upbeat story, but it's wonderful execution and Chip Zdarsky knocks it out of the park. This is a hell of a Jason Todd story. I wouldn't read the backup stories. There's a, a Harley Quinn story from Stephanie Phillips, Harley Quinn Ivy story from Stephanie Phillips. I don't think it was all that good. The outsider story from Brandon Thomas was kind of entertaining, but weird, especially as far as totally with this story. And then the, uh, the last story, the Grifter story is probably the best comic I've read from Matthew Rosenberg since those that run of like four or five uncanny X-Men comics he wrote that were good. So if you like Grifter, you'll probably like that one. I really just wish this was a standalone and this is the story I'd read. I'd, you can skip the rest, but is it worth this like six or seven or eight dollars? Cover price just for this. Probably not. I'll just wait for the collection. But this is awesome. Now let's get into the Joker story from James Tynan. And why this one does isn't doesn't work in the end. Now it certainly does work right out the beginning. There's a, a little of a, a prologue where James Gordon's remembering when he retired. He didn't retire. When he left the force in Chicago to come to Gotham. And uh, there was a guy that was at the bar and he was explaining that you know eventually you're going to see evil in the eye and if you don't put it down it will haunt you for the rest of your life and he explains how when he was on the force he walked in and there was a man eating a woman's face he got away and he was never able to track him down and we find out at the end that eventually that man ends up killing himself 
And when they find him, they, they got newspaper clippings of that moment. Like he never was able to get over it. He saw evil in the face. He did not you know, take it down and he never got over it. He ended up, he ends up taking his own life. Commissioner Gordon, he's no longer the commissioner, James Gordon. He's, uh, you know, he's on his own now. He's not really a police officer. He sees these things happening and he's just, he's got demons that he's battling. And the big one is the Joker, obviously with what happened to his daughter, Barbara Gordon, when he paralyzed her, assaulted her, sent her in a wheelchair. Obviously, eventually she did um, recover. He's just, he he's cannot get over all the things that Joker has done to him in his life. Obviously, just the things that he's done to Gotham as a city while he was the commissioner. All the times that he caught him, put him into Arkham. Everyone says it's Batman's fault. Well, it's equally Commissioner Gordon and some in the, the system's fault. For this guy, you know, why don't they ever give him the death penalty? Why doesn't anyone ever put him down? He keeps escaping and he keeps hurting people, keeps murdering people. He ends up, bl- he, you know, he blames himself. For the death of his his son James Gordon Jr., who was a sociopath, by the way, I don't understand why I'm supposed to um, like mourn that death so much. That guy was was absolutely psychotic. Not that I'm happy he's dead, but you know, it's hard to mourn somebody that's a murderer, that's firmly established as a murderer. But that that's me besides the point. But James Gordon blames himself because he the, the Joker kept getting away. Even though he kept capturing, kept putting him in Arkham, kept getting away, you know, obviously it was him him and Batman working together. And that haunts him. It's the one that got away. He doesn't want to end up like that guy that never caught this, this cannibal, end up killing himself because he could never get over what happened to him. This firmly, firmly establishes why Gordon would go to Europe or wherever if he knew where the Joker was and he wasn't the commissioner of Gotham to go and finally settle the score and take this guy off the streets. He's caused him nothing but pain his entire time in Gotham. He's hurt his family. He's caused tremendous amount of destruction to his city. Boom. He's got all the motivation in the world to maybe go over the edge, right? Kind of like what Jason Todd just did. But James Tyner does not execute this nearly as effective as Chip Zdarsky within the story. Because you get all this A-Day fallout, and none of it, none of it makes a lick of damn sense. James Tynan is the writer of Batman. He is establishing all the rules, the relationships, who people are, and what their motivations are. And once he does that, you have to play within the framework of your own story, and he does not do that. So clearly, uh, A-Day happens. They think they've lost all these... um, Criminals, they presume uh, Crane's dead. We know that's not true. Um, it, it, so they're going through the fallout. And so part of the fallout is Mayor Nakano brings Gordon in and offers him to head up the Joker task force. Mayor Nakano got elected by running on a like anti-Batman, anti-rogues you know, platform what character in the entire dc universe is more widely known to be associated with batman than gordon nakano hates batman why would he bring gordon in on this he literally has worked with the person that he wants to have murdered this goes against every motivation of nakano as the, the character that's leading to the magistrate and the downfall of Gotham and the murder of all these masks and the whole Batman family having to go underground. This is your story, James Tynan. You're the one that's laid the framework. This doesn't make sense. He literally got elected after Joker War because of all the things that happened saying that, that the, the masks were as big a problem as the villains. But we're going to go in and bring the man most asso- closely associated out in the open with Batman in the entire DC universe, and certainly within Gotham, former Commissioner Gordon. No, that, that does not happen whatsoever. Uh, he wouldn't do this. Otherwise, he wouldn't be Ma- Mayor Nakano, and we wouldn't be leading up to the magistrate. Next up, we get these big murals, and apparently the Caribbean community like in within Gotham are mourning the death of Bane like he was some big community leader. When has Bane done anything for anybody? He literally, in City of Bane, that preceded 
Joker war by about three minutes took over the entire city and was murdering people. Bane as a character is never, he's not Lex Luthor where he's trying to, to bring people onto the, to his side by being, quote, like pretending to be good. He's evil to the core. He's never done anything but be bad for Gotham and Batman and all these people. I don't care if he's Caribbean. Those people are not going to be on his side. This is so stupid. No, like you can't believe this stuff. Where does James Tynan come up with it? And it goes on with Punchline. Does anybody believe because Punchline had a freaking podcast talking about how much she appreciated the Joker that people would be behind her? The Joker war just happened. People died. She was a big part of that. There's literally an entire podcast documenting her being obsessed with the Joker and, and wanting to be a part of him. Him trying to push this like she's some type of folk hero is completely stupid. Obviously, that's a big part of the, the punchline story. It's ridiculous. You need to drop this and go back to the drawing board with your punchline character. Like, how weird are the people of Gotham? How dirty are the people of Gotham? How evil are the people of Gotham that they would go out there and worship these murderers? It's crazy. And if they did worship Bane, if they did think Bane was a hero, if they did think Punchline was a hero, and they celebrated these people, why would they vote Mayor Nakato in as the new mayor? If he's so anti-villain and anti-hero? It makes no sense. You need to like clean this stuff up, James Tynan. You're, you're contradicting yourself too much with these characters and their motivations. So right there, the, all the 8 day stuff and the fallout, none of it makes sense. And then we get the last part that doesn't make sense either. So he's firmly established why Jim Gordon, if he had the chance, could possibly go after Joker. But here this lady brings him in and she offers him $25 million. They know where Joker is. He's in Belize. I thought he was in Europe, but apparently he's in Belize right now. We'll give you $25 million. You don't have enough money to retire on as it is, Gordon. We'll send you to Belize. And you, and you can go track him down. No one knows the joke. No one's better equipped to track down the Joker than you. And Gordon says, well, I would say there's somebody better. And she's like, well, we're not, we don't think Batman's going to take our money. If Gordon could be bought, he would have been bought already. He's essentially the cop that is not on the take. He's never been motivated by money. You cannot even, not even $25 million is going to make Jim Gordon turn on his, on his, on his principles. And this right here makes him a hitman. That makes him a villain. It makes him a killer. He's no longer seeking out his own justice. He's doing it for their means. Now, is he going to, you know, in theory, get something out of it? Yes, but this goes against the very fabric of Jim Gordon. He would never agree to this. Now, if I think, I think if he knew where Joker was and he had an opportunity to go take care of it on his own terms without anyone paying for it, I think he would do that. You could probably set the story up with him going to Europe and going and trying to take care of business. But him having this lady try to pay him off to do it immediately ends the story. There's no more suspension of disbelief. This does not fit in with Jim Gordon's character. He can't be bought. He's not a hitman. He's not a villain. In the discussion. So James Tynan, equally effective as Chip Zdarsky at setting up the character motivations and why they might do something. Chip Zdarsky lays out a story, and boom, when he when he shoots that guy and finally kills somebody, you're like, I believe he would do that. It, it falls in line with the character and what he's experienced up to that moment. But when this happens, everything about the fallout of A-Day and, then it, and the trying to motivate him with money and things of that nature, it doesn't work. That's not Jim Gordon. And that's the, the difference in the execution of the two stories, and one of them it's like a four and a half, five star must read comic. And one of them is like a three, three and a half star. You know, it's it's the foundation, the layouts. It's probably going to be a fun story, but it, I don't think this is going to be in the annals of time. We're like, man, that's a great Commissioner Gordon story. Because it doesn't feel true to, the, true to life of the character. I certainly recommend both. Batman Urban Legends is a like highest recommend. Just the one story. Just the Red Hood story. The backups. The Grifter story is oh, it's actually pretty good, but the the Outsider story is kind of weird, and the Poison Ivy Harley story is actually pretty bad. As far as the Joker, like I, they got to cut out the punchline stuff. That it does not work. It's dragging this down. They did not need to motivate Jim Gordon that way. It does not work for the character. The art's really good. 
I think the story will probably be fun. It'll be forgettable because it's not going to be, you know, it's not Jim Gordon. That's the problem. So those are my thoughts on Batman Urban Legends and the Jokers. Two stories that firmly establish wonderful character motivations. One that executes it, executes it at its highest level and one that just goes off the rails a little bit into shenanigans and complete unbelievability.